Negativity comes naturally for most people. We're like moths to a frickin' flame, baby. We have this big old negativity bias, and if you'll hear me out, I think it can be pretty interesting where and to whom we point that negativity. And since I don't know how to incite your own negativity, this video will be a sort of account of one historically negative group. Besides, the only thing better than sneering and snapping is grabbing some popcorn and watching someone else do it. So back to the task at hand. What is our negativity directed at? In part one, I introduced the vehicle that presents these directions, cynicism. Over time, the focus of cynicism has changed and evolved quite a bit. This is a story that covers those changes, and hopefully provides insight to greater societal changes in the process. Cynicism was once a proud philosophy, but its meaning has transformed through the ages. This happened to the point where today it's just a generally ambiguous term for any class of doubters or really just people that are assholes. But alright, so in part one, we went from the original conception of cynicism, a philosophy in ancient Greece, and then we covered its history till the Roman era. Let's refresh. Diogenes of Snope, original cynic. Intentionally poor, didn't need money to eat, sleep, or poops, or why bother? He was very sassy and made fun of people for valuing things like money and status or participating in society. How was this a philosophy? It was a philosophy because it supposed people were natural beings and so the notion of civility is a farce and money and power makes people evil. This got passed down and around a couple times into a more formalized philosophy called Stoicism. Stoicism got the whole, hey man, don't worry about what you can't control, man, just go with the flow, stuff from cynicism out of the general idea that you shouldn't be super hot and bothered by the things that are valuable in society, like people's opinions or trying to contradict fate and fortune. So then the Stoics built up their ideas over and over, and eventually didn't really super care about cynical poverty anymore, but just liked the mentality of steadfastness and mastery of your emotions. This transition compounded even more to the point where one cynicism became two, and there was an ideological split. The Stoics in the Roman era created a popular belief that cynics represented an intellectual exposing of societal evil. This was well accepted by educated and elite people, whereas the other forms of cynicism were the complete opposite. They were the so-called street cynics who only kept up to the super impoverished lifestyle and were dirty and hated the rich. These scrambles of ragamuffins said that that was their conscious choice to be poor, and it was a philosophy, so back off. The elite and followers of the high-class cynicism of course branded these street cynics as false inheritors of cynicism. This created a great battle between the cynical split. You got this more eloquent, stoically bound idea, which centers on stuff like self-mastery and the virtue of moderation, right? And then the street cynic is your more typically decrepit figure. They shout at rich people for being greedy, but claim to be virtuous. So then we arrived here. We begin the battle with a point against the street cynics. His name was Lucian of Samosata. He wrote The Death of Peregrinus, written in the year 165, and is recorded as one of the oldest surviving satirical works. It was about Peregrinus and his death. Peregrinus was some dude who loved to build his reputation by being poor. He made a name for himself again and again, revered by the communities he visited as a virtuous god and a saint. In actuality though, he was a murderous adulterer on the run for his crimes. He avoided all persecution for his immorality by feigning righteousness as a cynic philosopher. Despite his worldly reputation, he takes advantage of gullible Christians and pagans everywhere in his wake, acquiring gifts and safe passage across the realm. By its conclusion, spoilers, Peregrinus burns himself to death at the Olympics, an ultimate act to cement his legacy as a hero, his hunger never ceasing for more fame. The book supposes that these people, street cynics, not truly give up social life in the name of virtue, but would routinely go against their word if just given the opportunity for personal gain. The street cynics were just pretenders that needed an excuse to continue their sad existence. They were just jealous of great wealth. Lucian sought to expose the jealous street cynics and took it to new heights, playfully sneering and jesting 
with his insincerity making his intentions inscrutable. His satire that exposed wickedness found good company with the original founders of cynicism, who equally weaponized their wit to expose and ridicule the shallow intentions of others. The difference was that unlike the original cynics, who were witty hobos knocking the elite down a peg, Lucian was amongst the elite and criticized the impoverished cynics like Peregrinus. The cynical sneer in the Roman era had begun to direct itself at its former meaning. For Roman era cynicism, Lucian was perhaps the best showcase of the quote, split between the educated satirist who inherits the cynic's sardonic wit and a low-level sect, composed of the unstable and resentful, bums and moral zealots, outsiders, and narcissists. Lucian was a figurehead for the new banner of Roman era cynicism, and can best be described as literary cynicism. It's based on outsmarting and belittling others, making you seem better than them. The ancient cynics did this too, but the Romans failed to back up their words with literal piss and shit so it had a little less oomph to it. Ancient cynics were the sticks and stones type of guys, and Roman era cynicism more relied on words and solely written ridicule. That was of course until the 4th century with one emperor's new groove. Emperor Julian liked to study philosophy and ancient Greek pagan doctrines. Rising to power in a particularly Christian period of the Roman era, this interest in Greek culture earned him the title of Julian the apostate. And so our Julian was doing his thing, decreeing orders and being well versed in Greek thought, as well as strolling through Rome once in a while to see the common folk. And then on one of these strolls, he notices all this mischief afoot caused by the so-called street cynics and their aggressive poverty. They're doing their jive of shouting obscenities at the rich and powerful. He saw this and said, huh. The claimed virtue of these cynics piqued his interest. So when he got back, he pulled out his old college textbook and began to study the cynicism of old. Coincidentally, his research led his beliefs to align nicely with the official, educated Roman and Stoic thought before him. He interpreted that the cynics ought to be respectable and cunning, which he did not see in the street cynics outside. His beliefs were compounded by the fact that high culture of the day was centered on purity, unity, and completeness. These values were once in Greek ideology and now Christian society and were championed by Platonic thought. Plato's ideas reached for enlightenment and higher forms of existence through education and steadfastness. Virtue was seen as exclusive to those who, quote, have the strength and discipline to maintain a secure and stable identity amid corruption and upheaval. It is the life of an incipient educated elite, of those who justify their elevation above the uneducated, uncultivated masses in near cosmic terms. Julian the Apostate had found an almost religious desire to elevate himself as well, and so the street cynics who valued subordination easily drew contempt from the emperor. Julian the Apostate preferred the co-opted definition of cynicism that looked more like the ancient notion of paideia. Paideia was a set of strict educational customs to keep the upper classes in check from abusing their high status. Paideia, quote, controlled them by ritualizing their responses and by bridling their raw nature through measured gestures. They say paideia, I think politics and politeness. The three Ps, if you will. A good follower of the Ps made for a good aristocrat. And aristocrats were, of course, the good followers of Aristotle, who, of course, was a good follower of the great Plato who of course brings us back to the elevation of form and a unified soul which surpasses the body. I am presenting a theme of society seeking superiority. It's a theme that runs through the Roman Stoics and the literary cynics, and now Julian the Apostate. With cynicism now swept up into this mad bag of social elitism, Julian could then take his wrath out into the street cynics who feigned possessing virtue. Ansgar Allen sums up Julian's thoughts on these street cynics nicely. Devoid of respect, operating without reverence for the gods, 
hell-bent on destroying all beauty, honesty, and goodness, trampling justice and honor underfoot, and perhaps worst of all, turning philosophy into a laughing stock, street cynics were promoting a barbarian creed, and were doing so right at the center of the Roman Empire. These cynic pretenders should not be driven from the city, Julian decided. Death by stoning would be more appropriate. So then he killed them all. Yep, no more street cynics. They all died. Forever and ever. And then the war was over. The educated and the aristocratic had won out over the impoverished pit vipers of the street cynics. After the philosophically but not domiciliarily endowed individuals were wiped from the face of the earth, no one really cared about cynics anymore. The Middle Ages were not particularly known for their robust education of Greek thought and influence. It would take another millennium or so for people to really start caring about all that stuff again. Our cynicism would come back though, so let's talk about this Renaissance stuff. It was an early re-emergence of the humanities and a liberal education. It consisted of philosophy and critical thinking mixed with a very generous dose of rhetoric and prose and politeness and high culture. Perhaps one of the biggest influences on the Renaissance was the incredibly stately Cicero. Cicero was a Roman era influencer around the year zero that made great contributions to the world of stately decorum and powerful speech. He was basically the king of rhetoric and helped important people sound like they were important too. His teachings post-Renaissance were used to train the noble schoolboys to become well-spoken kings and courtiers. The transition from the Middle Ages to the early modern period saw a great emphasis and demand for essentially sounding intelligent. This is where our cynicism takes the stage. In these textbooks to teach kids how to sound smart, speak good, would be famous anecdotes and sayings of people sounding smart and speaking good. The Greek and Roman sages had many quotes implemented into this education, which displayed the mastery of their wit and fearless speech. For this reason, our founding cynics were enlisted to provide examples of speaking up for oneself and emboldening one's character. Cynicism was passed around through random anecdotes that lacked all context. In this sense, cynicism was vernacularized to teach a boy to speak eloquently and courageously. The original point of who to speak courageously against was completely lost. Again, we see a philosophy of poverty being equipped by its adversaries. Cynicism was now unrecognizable by name, and its figureheads were, at most, a simple tool to encourage the nobility's youth. What's more is that Cicero had a couple of thoughts about the cynics which made their way through the Renaissance. Being amongst the Roman educated elite, Cicero held nothing but the highest contempt for cynics and their unkempt nature. He acknowledged their rhetorical skill, but could not stand for their attacks on civility. As such, Cicero considered their self-control to be left wanting. His perception of cynics was like Will Hunting in that one movie. Matt Damon plays a dude who's super smart, but is a street rat who refuses to behave. When skills are not applied in a practiced way, says Cicero, it only looks like a lashing out into society, or into Scott William Winters. The point is, you're not making any real progress, and you're without a purpose. You're just a smart punk that'll never make any difference in the world. Cicero found the cynics to be a useless waste of prowess in public speaking. The aim of this depiction, as it was carried into early modern England, was as a cautionary tale. This is what happens when a gentleman runs astray from his teachings on etiquette. They become snarky and sour and go, how? In stark contrast to Roman era cynicism, which was all about self-mastery and purifying your desires, Cicero's cynicism was a result of a lack of self-mastery, becoming contemptuous, poor-mannered, and dispossessed. Cicero's dominant interpretation would then set the stage for our more modern writers to build a new meaning. Early modern writers would begin to coin the term cynic as a type of person, 
thus defacing it as an ideology and philosophy. It went from an act of practicing cynicism and came more about outing someone as a cynic, like an insult or a name calling. This should feel a little bit more reminiscent of our common definitions of a cynic. The first actor in our play of modern cynicism is William Shakespeare's Timon of Athens. Timon as a play was one of Shakespeare's least popular and generally considered as incomplete. As for the play itself, it was set in ancient Greece and our title's namesake character Timon was an immensely popular and wealthy man. With his wealth, he bestowed many gifts to his friends in varying circles. He held fancy schmancy banquets and bankrolled everything without a care in the world. This was until the inevitable, when he ran broke from his lavish spending on these so-called friends. Once broke, he found himself betrayed and alone without aid from his companions who only valued him for his money. Shocker. He became spiteful. He hated man and his stupid greed, and then retreated into the woods and into madness. His descent from high esteem mirrored the Ciceronian view of the uncouth gentleman, who may also become dispossessed by their lack of self-control. This type of negligent cynicism was even more blatantly represented in Timon's companion, Ape Mantis. Ape Mantis was a philosopher invited to the banquets. He constantly warned Timon of the nature of his friends, but to no avail. His general distrust of men, as well as his dog-like vulgarity, led him to be branded as a cynic. But he was not described as having any of the explicit practices of ancient cynicism, and so we could understand Ape Mantis more as a modern misrepresentation of a cynic. He perhaps could have better represented the sourness of street cynics more so than the ancient original. Also because the Timon of Athens was an actual guy and predated the establishment of cynicism in the first place. This is what makes Shakespeare's representation of cynical behavior something of a rhetorical affliction rather than a reputable philosophy. Now the cool thing about this narrative is that the cynical behavior shown in the play might be a reflection of Shakespeare's perception of society. You see, Mantis berated the aristocratic members of Timon's circle, continuously warning Timon of their untrustworthiness and essentially foreshadowing Timon's ultimate fall from grace. But in the end, his aggressive assertions do nothing to prevent Timon's fate. The dispossessed and disillusioned cynicism in the play, quote, testifies to a larger intellectual and social malaise, where their ineffectiveness only reflects the more general paralysis affecting Timon's Athens. The central theme of the play, beyond the tragedy of man's greed, is the absolute uselessness of rhetoric and education to stop it. Just like Ape Mantis, possessing an awareness of society does not save anyone from their own selfish and doomed priorities. This is the ailment of early modern writers who attempt to use satire and rhetoric to reveal issues in society, but fail to move others on fixing it. This failed purpose of satire can be shown through Ape Mantis in Act 1, Scene 1 in the play. In response to Ape Mantis being offered a share of time and wealth, Ape Mantis retorts, and I don't really know how to read Shakespeare, like the pentameter thing, so... No, all nothing, for if I should be bribed to there would be none left to rail upon thee, and then thou wouldst sin the faster. Thou givest so long, Timon, I fear me thou wilt give away thyself in paper shortly. What needs these feasts, pomps, and vainglories? Ape Mantis believes that his wrath and ridicule is actually beneficial. If he was to expose the vice of giving, in effect it may save Timon from his own values. The cynical ape mantis could be presenting the playwright's inner conflict of trying to impact their environment without taking part in it themselves. Unfortunately, however, as presented in the play, ape mantis can do nothing but usher Timon to his impending doom, essentially being complicit to the societal catastrophes which he attacks and berates others for causing. Cynical cleverness, then, has no practical use and is unable to create solutions to the problems they expose. 
Shakespeare can be interpreted as presenting the failure of a quote, attempt to resurrect old techniques like rhetoric, which are now rendered defunct by the early development of a capitalist economy, where cash, and no longer the sovereign, is king. Timon and Cicero created this new form of negativity titled cynicism, which is a reaction to this failure. When the original cynics acted out of virtue and they designed resistance to civility, the early modern form was a responsive giving up of a starry-eyed idealism. It is a realization that despite all the hoot and hollering, decay is inevitable. It is no longer a philosophy at all, but an ugly misanthropy of the aware and the educated. The continued existential crisis of the tortured artist could no better be examined than through the work of John Marston, a contemporary of Shakespeare. In 1599, John Marston's scourge of villainy was a self-defeating attack on civility, expressing the failure of the culture of educated people to deliver a more humane society. His crude and aggressive satire was described by Joseph Hall as the wheel of a well couched firework that flies out on all sides, not without scorching itself. The new modern cynic of Marston acts as a useless, self-aware, and self-inflicting attack on the elite. Marston was an example of the bad gentleman. He is the result of a liberal education that is washed up and sees no future. A doomsday prepper which outlines the beginning of the end of liberal arts and a movement towards a more technical and economic world. The last stand for our cynicism against the threat of disillusion was the Age of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was marked by a revival of liberal arts and its ability to influence political revolution. The Roman era cynicism, which held claims of fearless speech and rejection of false virtue, was closely aligned with many ideals brought with the Enlightenment and played into the complex revival of cynicism. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for one, resonated with the cynical message. He found himself to be poor-mannered and was disillusioned with mankind's greed. This made him the perfect candidate as the prototypical enlightened cynic. He occupied the transitional state between the older philosophy, which had freed itself from the vices of society, and the new misanthropic cynicism, where those very same vices now seem inescapable. The problem is that it becomes difficult to point out flaws while still being forced to participate and worsen the condition. With ease, critics could come to know Rousseau as a quote, master of an artful reflexivity that skillfully found fault with others on every point, but in itself always discovered only the purest intentions. And so the cycle begins. One dude claims to expose the flaws of the world, and another is critical of their false awareness, ad infinitum. It was up to our full-fledged modern cynic Voltaire to get us full circle. Voltaire held the role of literary cynic in his enlightened world. He acted to expose Rousseau and his uncivilized tendencies, as he was not someone who was saving society, but was actually a hypocrite who proved just as unvirtuous as the rest. Rousseau played his part as street cynic and Voltaire the literary cynic, although now these terms were greatly diluted. Voltaire held none of the idealized beliefs of what a cynic should be, and Rousseau had none of the impoverished practices of the street cynic. Cynicism has now lost all complexity, philosophically at least, and is a pieced together smorgasbord of meaning. The belief that all people act out of self-interest and the situational need to expose that self-interest is now so commonplace that you might just have to classify everyone as a form of Voltaire-esque cynic. People routinely posture as having more awareness than the people who are the problem. Historically, that negativity pivots back and forth between those who are rich, those who are poor, those who are educated, and those who aren't. The modern cynic holds just a little bit of contempt towards just about every part of life with no good faith or optimism left. People, just like the state of negativity, are the products of a constant cycle of being broken down and ruined, misinterpreted, 
and oversimplified. All this amounts to a weird complexity of bits and pieces that once were useful for some direction, but now are worthless parts strung together by memory. Because people, like the essence of a cynic, are far too messy to easily define. I think that's pretty cool. In the words of Antonio Banderas, you know, it's easier to pull the trigger than play guitar. Easier to destroy than to create. Which is true, and why I think it's all the more important to work with what we got. Okay, thanks. Bye.